Kibbapedi is a town in North and South Australia, 846 kilometres north of Adelaide on the Stewart Highway. The town is known as the opal capital of the world because of the quantity of precious opals that are mined there. Kibbapedi is probably best known for its unique style of underground living. A standard three bedroom cave home with lounge, kitchen and bathroom can be excavated out of the rock in the hillside for a similar price to a house on the surface. It remains at a constant temperature, whereas surface living needs an air conditioning, especially during the summer months, with temperatures exceeding 40 degrees Celsius. Both the town and hinterland, for different reasons, are very photogenic and have therefore attracted filmmakers. The town itself was the setting for the 2005 film Opal Dream. The hinterland, notably the breakaways and moon plane, have featured as backdrops in films including Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, Red Planet, Priscilla Queen of the Desert, Pitch Black and Salute of the Jugger, which made considerable use of locals as extras. Monument to John McDowell Stewart, framed by the background of the Cooper Peaky Hills and the mines. Okay, we're about 5k south of Kerbapedi and this is where the next part of our journey begins. William Creek across to uh, across the William Creek Road to the Unadatta Road which will follow us around to Maree which is the beginning of the Birdsville track and then further south and then into the Flinders Ranges. This is just uh, east of Kerbapedi along the uh, William Creek Road and the, the land out there is just dry, barren as you can see. The GPS shows us this coming out of a creek. We're actually travelling uh, from left to right on the screen. The creek we're going through there is Engineer Creek. In dry times, that's what it looks like. The other thing of interest is that the uh, only vegetation you see, the trees and bushes, is along the creek bed. We're now back into uh, certainly sand hills and uh, very much open, open plain, open country, not very much vegetation. This is pretty much I guess what we imagine desert to be like when we talk about it in Australia but there's all different types of deserts here. According to the map and the GPS, this out here is a lake and right in the middle of it is built a set of cattle yards and there's a trough. You get on the side of the road some holding yards and in the middle of the holding yards that contraption I'm positive is used for tying the, the cattle to when they brand them. So that would be a branding yard I would imagine. There's our first objective is to reach the Udna Data track, we've done that we're heading to the right to Mari, which is about 207k. This is William Creek. William Creek, a taste of the outback. Please drop a bulldust here. The William Creek Hotel started out as a boarding house circa 1886. It became a store, wine bar, and boarding house shortly thereafter. No record can be found as to when it became a hotel. The bar in the William Creek Hotel was originally the bar of the Coward Springs Hotel. The pub includes a restaurant, over-the-counter snacks, petrol station, tyre repair shop, accommodation, camping grounds and much, much more. A golf course exists to the west of the hotel. William Creek is South Australia's smallest town. The town is surrounded by one of Australia's largest cattle properties, Anna Creek Station, which is almost half the size of Tasmania. The old Gann Railway, which passes through William Creek, ran from Port Augusta via Quorn, Hawker, Parachilna, Copley, Farina, Maree, Curtamurka, William Creek and Udnadatta to Alice Springs. 
construction of this narrow gauge line started in 1878. The old Gann line was used for the last time in October 1980, but the William Creek Hotel lives on. Overground telephone line pass through here. Just south of William Creek, heading along the Nadada track, and that's the landscape ahead of us. Desolate, and it's desert. Following along the side of the road here, that raised piece in the middle of the screen, is the old Gann railway line before it was realigned. And there's still bits of uh, old sleepers and stuff here too. Part of an overpass over a creek. Still running alongside the road, but just a bit further away. Railway line, but a lot of wooden sleepers in there. Tons of them. It's going to say Beresford Boar Historic Rail Siding. The old Beresford Railway Siding was one of the sites along the line which had giant water softeners to prepare water for the steam locomotives. Water for the GAN was not extracted from the mound springs, but from deep underground bores. At the sidings you can see water softener tanks built to remove the harmful minerals from the bore water that caused heavy scaling on the boilers of the steam trains. Unfortunately, there is no water softener available at the borehead at Beresford siding where there is a great camp besides the dam, although the hot water coming from the bore is irresistible after a few days of bush camping. Someone has laid a few sleepers for a shower floor and if you don't mind the colour of the water, black, it's a great refresher. This large dam was built to supply water to the steam locomotives but is now used as a watering hole for an incredible amount of wildlife including hundreds of cattle, corellas, galahs, ducks, top knot pigeons, eagles and crows. Sides, caravan parking type thing. A place is called Coward Springs over there in the trees. The old Gann running along the left hand side of the car and an old railway station remains of just sitting there. Just makes you wonder where people were coming or going from. 
Because there's nothing around for miles. I know there's sheep stations, cattle country. It's a pretty harsh old life it was. Sitting out in the middle of the desert. The Kurtamurka siding was built in 1888 and is the last remaining station yard of any significance left intact on the old Gan Railway and includes station yard, water treatment plant, tower and associated water tank and the Fettler's cottages. Long before the closure of the line in 1980, the site had already fallen into disrepair. In 1989, heavy rains near Lake Eyre South dumped more than 381 millimetres of rain in 44 hours, twisting part of the remaining track work left in the Kurtamurka yard. It has been brought back from obscurity by members of the Gann Railway Preservation Society. In an effort to raise the finance for this project, a ball is organised every two years. The first ball in 1986 was attended by just 100 people. Ten years later, the ball attracted several thousand men and women from all over Australia and even some from overseas. The Kennecott-type lime soda water softening plant was erected in 1943-44. This was necessary to soften the highly mineralised water found locally. We've decided to uh, use the hospitality of Kurnamooka and set up in a couple of their rooms. Sleeping on the floor for the night, so just putting up the tent. In the middle room, the fireman has lit the fire. Early morning Kurnamooka. This is a wonderful place. We were very lucky that um, we were able to camp there and there wasn't someone there before us because it was quite late in the day when we stopped. This photo is uh, a train going over the Stewart Creek Bridge, which is only one kilometre west of here apparently. So I'm going to wander up and take a look. This is the Stewart River Bridge. It's about a kilometre from the west of the siding and it's 433 metres long, which is the second longest bridge on the former Gann Line. It was built in 1887-88 and is included in both the state and national heritage registers. We're currently standing right on the southern tip of Lake Eyre South, right in there. Straight on the Maree, right to Roxby Downs and Woomera. This country is dead flat for as far as the eye can see. It's just clay country and then all of a sudden, a little bit of a rise and then a hill, Herbert Hill. And then back to flatness. We've been touring along, seeing nothing, about 300 kilometres almost, and we come across this right on the side of the road. Now it's like a station or something, it's called Alberry Creek, and just across the road is that. Now whether it's all part of the same complex or not, probably is. Now the old water tank from the rail, the interesting part is, they stuck an old car in the front of it, 
a pile out the back of it, so as you're coming along, it looks like a dog. Someone with a sense of humour, a bit of time in the hands. Accepted. Accepted. <laughs> Donation thing in the hole there. The bus here is sitting on the old rail line. <coughs> well, this is inside the bus, and they use a recording studio and cooking and doing all sorts of things here. What a great idea. Geez, you wouldn't want to be too out of it when you're stepping like this in the middle of the night. <laughs> We're about to put a trapeze Scar up here. Yeah. All right. All that red stuff is <laughs> what a What are you doing with the car? Does anyone sit in it or not? No. Which car? The yeah. car on the big red thing. Oh, it? no. no. That's, um, oh, that's I haven't seen anybody. Yes. I was going to say, I thought, oh, I didn't know I had a cage. I thought, oh, maybe oh, someone gets in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been discussed, definitely. I don't know if anyone's got around to do it, though. Yeah. There's just too many things to get around yeah, to around yeah, here. Yeah. It's good, yeah. We're getting the trapeze up soon and we're reorganising camp there. and. Setting that back up because we've been here for two weeks, we've got a bit bored with the way it was. Well, we've just had a talk to some of the locals, it's nothing more and nothing less than a bit of a hippie commune. But bloody nice people, very good. The flat ground that we've been travelling along, it's an incredible surprise to come over the top of a hill and be confronted with this. Absolutely fabulous, beautiful country. Arid, it has its own beauty. About 45 kilometres to the west of Maree. And of course there's a constant reminder of the old rail line, wherever you go down the edge of a track, which is a good thing. To me there's nothing better than the arid landscape. Especially when you see that the trees there give away the location of the creek and where the uh, water is, whether it be above or below ground. Yet another rail siding on the, this one hasn't been looked after as the others have and of course it's been vandalised and graffitied okay, This is Maree. Maree lies 685 kilometres north of Adelaide at the junction of the Udnadatta track and the Birdsville track and is only 49 metres above sea level. The first European to explore the area was Edward John Eyre, who passed through in 1840. In 1859, explorer John McDowell Stewart visited the area, and his assistant, Hergot, discovered the springs after which the town was initially named. Originally called Hergot Springs, the town's name was changed to Maree in 1918 due to anti-German sentiment after World War I. The Central Australia Railway reached the town in 1883 and the town became a major railhead for the cattle industry. The railway then continued north from the town to Alice Springs and was completed in 1929. This was the route of the passenger train known as the GAN. In 1957 the line south of Maree was rebuilt as standard gauge on a flatter alignment to support moving coal from Lee Creek to Port Augusta. This made Maree a break of gauge on the GAN as the remainder was still narrow gauge until 1980 when the Adelaide to Alice Springs line was rebuilt much further west and Maree lost its railway completely. Now it goes without saying but this is the, the old uh, 
train station here at Maree, which is still being maintained. That's great. Good stuff. Hasn't been a train through here for 28 years and counting. Tom Cruise was well recognised for doing the mail run from Maree to Birdsville in the early days. This is his one of his trucks. Near the town's solitary pub is a white plaque commemorating the Simpson Desert Expedition of 1939 in which Cecil T. Madigan and his party crossed the harsh dry region to the north of the town. Well, about three or four hundred metres, if that, from the Mari Hotel is the legendary Birdsville track. The stories of people battling the track in the old days to open up this country are legend. Although, <laughs> this part of it, it's bitumized, which sort of takes away from the uh, aura of it a bit, but not for too long. It's uh, gravel up ahead, but a grave gravel road these days, anyone can do it. I'm not that far out of Maree, only about 20k, and already we're starting to get vegetation where before there was very little, if any, in most cases. Travelling south towards Lee Creek. Again, over there in the distance, Farina, another of the stations on the Old Gan line. Another old ruins is sitting on top of the hill there. We're just approaching Lyndhurst. Lyndhurst began its life as a railway siding in 1878 and shortly after became the railhead for cattle from the northeast, which were being walked along the legendary Streslacki track to Lyndhurst. The Lyndhurst Hotel was originally located at Mount Freeling and was dismantled and moved on camel trains to Lyndhurst where it was opened on the 31st of December 1896. Tragedy struck the hotel in January 1988 when a leaking gas cylinder ignited a pilot light at the rear of the hotel causing an inferno that totally destroyed the hotel in about seven minutes. For approximately six months the hotel operated out of the town hall while being rebuilt. An unused building was purchased from Moomba and transported by road train to Lyndhurst and building started on the original hotel site. Part of the original fireplace still remains today. Since the rebuild, there have been a number of further improvements made, mainly the addition of further accommodation rooms and the addition of a caravan park. This is a pit on the Lee Creek Coalfield. This is a lookout point for the Lee Creek mining operation. The old walking drag line is known as a Bucharest Erie 9W. It began service at Lee Creek in 1951. It has a 49 metre boom and a 7 cubic metre bucket, which was at the time the largest in Australia. The huge tyre standing next to the drag line achieved a world record of 289,215 kilometres and 17,520 hours in service before it was retired. Lee Creek is a company coal mining town on the edge of the desert. It is a modern township with a modern shopping centre and housing for the workers and their families who provide the labour force for the huge Lee Creek open cut coal mine which exists 22 kilometres north of the town. The township is known as Lee Creek South. It is a new township because the original settlement at Lee Creek, located 13 kilometres north of the present site, happened to be on the coal seam. The new town site was chosen in 1977 and the first houses were occupied in 1980. The entire old town was auctioned off. 
The Lee Creek area was first settled by Harry Lee in 1856. Coal was discovered in 1888 and small quantities were mined, but it wasn't until 1943 that the fields were commercially exploited. By 1986, 100 million cubic metres of overburden had been removed from the mine site. Early mining was thwarted by mine shafts being filled with water, which made mining nearly impossible, which is interesting considering the annual rainfall is only 205 millimetres a year. Well, this is our first look at the Flinders Ranges. Wedge tail eagle. This is the Prairie Hotel at Parachilna. Parachilna is one of those tiny towns which, if you're not looking, you could easily pass by. Today it comprises nothing more than the railway station, where, each night, as regular as clockwork, a vast coal train from Lee Creek heads south to Port Augusta. A few buildings which have been used as cheap backpacker accommodation in the very attractive and recently modernised Prairie Hotel. Parachilna was the rail siding where copper ore from Blinman was transported to. We're back on the gravel and we're heading uh, east again. And uh, we're looking for a tourist village that's out this way. Little birds in the tree there too. Parachilna Gorge. Parachilna Gorge. Parachilna Gorge, that's it. This is the main street of Blinman, South Australia, Flinders Ranges, 20 to 6, July 8. And we continue to kick goals because we've come up with an absolutely beautiful, quaint little town and a U-butte pub with some rooms, hopefully. And if not, rooms, camping areas. For weary travellers. This is the main street of a little town in the Flinders Ranges called Blinman. Copper was discovered at Blinman by a shepherd, Robert Blinman, in 1859. Copper mining occurred in the area from around 1862 through to 1918 when the ore ran out. In total, around 10,000 tonnes of copper were removed from the area, with most of it being mined in the years between 1903 and 1918, when the town's population peaked at around 2,000 people. One of the greatest problems which still exists today had been transporting the copper economically from the mine to the nearest ports. Today the settlement verges on being a ghost town. There is little more than a pub and a few houses with the main interest lying in the remnants of the old mines which exist in all their rusted glory. Blinman is a very tiny little settlement with a hotel, a post office, a general store and very little else. That's literally about it. The police station dates from 1874 and the North Blinman Hotel has parts which date from the 1860s, although there is a decidedly modern glassed-in swimming pool next to the hotel, which, given the size of the town, seems an extravagance out of all proportion to the rest of the town. One of the old miners' cottages. Well, it's early in the morning and uh, we're cooking breakfast. The Blinman Cemetery lies at the southern end of the town, is old and dilapidated, but it tells a remarkable story of survival in this harsh land. Here are graves of women who died in childbirth, of men killed working with explosives near the mine, of little-known explorers like William Keckwick, who died in 1872, who was the second in charge to John McDowell Stewart when he crossed Central Australia. The sign said the Great Wall of China, and that's it along the top of that ridge up there. What an amazing structure. From our vantage point at the uh, Great Wall of China lookout, we look to the right, and 
this is the view that we have. Absolutely gorgeous. There's the Great Wall of China coming into view. Heading into the uh, main part of the Flinders Ranges. The road which will wind around and take us down to Wilpena Pound. One of the creek beds running through the range. There are hundreds of them, obviously. over a hill and be confronted by this, eh? Bunyaroo Gorge, and I guess that's how you pronounce it. Imagine there'd be a bit of water flow through this if it really came down.
are ahead for tourists in the park today, so you don't want to meet someone coming the other way as a bit of a cowboy, that's for sure. Some of these old trees and everything through here looks like they're beautiful. Okay, okay, this is the hill we've just come up. And down below there is Pregina Gorge. This is the view from Razorback Lookout. Probably one of the highest points that we're going to reach, I'd suggest, today. like we're driving through parkland on top of a hill. There's a fence there, so maybe that's pastoral land, maybe. This is Will Pena. I was expecting a town. There's a resort, there's powered sites in the campground. This is at Will Pena, it's taking absolutely no notice of anyone going past. This is behind a fence, so it's probably probably a pet. Okay, this is Will Pena Pound uh, and what it's all about. Apparently it's a natural amphitheatre and the best way to have a look at it of course is obviously is to walk and there's a lot of marked trails that suit your ability and interest and uh, there's quite a number of those. 
ranging from one hour up to something like eight hours depending on which one you particularly want to walk on. You can get a, a bus trip into the place. Uh, we're on our way through at this point in time we've got problems with an engine on one of the vehicles so we're heading into civilization to get that sorted so we won't be doing any of these walks. You really do need to come in here for probably about a week to experience what Will Pina is all about. Beautiful countryside here. This is a shuttle bus takes you in and drops you off at the uh, points where you want to walk from. There's a campground just through the trees over there and there's also a resort here as well. well we're on the road now to Hawker. Uh, we're on our way out of the Flinders Ranges. I mean we're going to be travelling through them for a little while. But uh, Will Pena was a disappointment. Uh, I was expecting something different to that. Um, the pound, okay, it's something that uh, you need to stay there for to go and have a look at. But Will Pena itself appears to be something like um, Yolara and a couple of other places which are set up strictly for the tourists. Except of course Yolara does have a shopping centre um, and various facilities, a number of facilities. Will Pena really has a resort, the caravan park. And that appears to be it. Very disappointing, but um, well, heck, you're allowed one disappointment in the trip, aren't you? It's been fabulous so far. That uh, probably officially ends that part of our journey, which brought us from Cuba Pedy down the Udnadana track and into the Flinders Ranges. It's been rather an interesting few days and something that uh, we're well pleased that we decided to attempt, despite the fact that we've been having problems with the, uh, the other vehicle in front of us with regard to um, a harmonic balance of seal in the motor. This is Hawker. Which is probably more of what we expected of Will Pena. Is that what bank you in? The wedge bank. Alright. It'll do, ANZ will do just fine, champion. This is the main drag facing south of Hawker. So I suppose you call the people that live here Hawkers. That's the cafe we're about to go and see if we can get lunch. It's two o'clock. All the way from Cooper Pedy we've been seeing ads pasted up on walls of servos and places for the travelling road show, the 1908 Talbot that drew first transverse Australia, first vehicle to 100 years ago. And I was only just looking at the same advert on this servo window when I turned around and there it is, pulling in. Unbelievable. That was the route it took from Adelaide to Darwin. There's the poor old thing in a stony creek bed. I've read the story, it's very entertaining. And there's the actual vehicle of the Birdwood Motor Museum, which is our next destination. 